Ja, dann einen schönen guten Abend an all diejenigen, das sind Sie ja, die den Weg zu uns gefunden haben, trotz verlockendem schönen Sommerwetter draußen. Wir hätten uns natürlich angesichts dieses prominenten Gastes etwas mehr Menschen gewünscht, aber fühlen Sie sich dann umso geehrter, dass Sie Michael Claire heute Abend bei der Green Lecture zuhören dürfen und Teil auch einer Diskussion sind. Ich möchte Sie herzlich willkommen heißen zu unserer zweiten Green Lecture mit dem Thema Die Welt im Rohstoffrausch, was bleibt übrig? Sie sind Gast des, der zweiten Grünen Lecture und ich möchte ganz kurz erklären, was eigentlich sich hinter diesem Format Green Lecture verbirgt, kurz und knapp. Es ist ein neues Format bei uns hier in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung, und Absicht ist, dass wir Denkerinnen und Denker, Aktivistinnen und Aktivisten aus dem Ausland, und zwar nicht nur aus dem europäischen Ausland, sondern weltweit, auch aus dem schönen Netzwerk der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung, hier zu uns her einladen nach Berlin, um eben über Fragen globaler Gerechtigkeit, Zukunftsfähigkeit, Nachhaltigkeit und vor allem natürlich auch über Visionen und Lösungsvorschläge, wie wir aus den globalen Krisen kommen können, zu diskutieren. Wir sind überzeugt davon, dass es viele, viele gute Analysen gibt, aber auch neue gesellschaftliche Praxen in anderen Ländern, neue Ideen, von denen wir hier in Deutschland lernen und profitieren können. Die Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung versteht sich als ein Ort, in dem Austausch auch internationaler organisiert wird, ich bin überzeugt, wir sind alle überzeugt, dass wir mehr denn je Denk- und Diskursräume brauchen, um uns eben genau gemeinsam mit anderen Menschen auf dieser Welt Gedanken darüber zu machen, wie wir eigentlich das hehre Ziel von Demokratie, Menschenrechten, globaler Klima- und Ressourcengerechtigkeit realisieren, uns dazu auszutauschen. Leider und das ist auch eine Intention von Green Lecture. Nicht leider, ich fange andersrum an. Wir möchten mit Green Lecture unsere internationalen Gäste, Denkerinnen und Denker, aber auch Aktivistinnen, vor allem auch mit Menschen hier in Berlin, die in der Tagespolitik stecken, zusammenbringen. Bei uns als Grüner Stiftung sind es grüne Politikerinnen und Politiker, die ja oft auch, auch wenn sie Grüne sind, ihre Wurzeln oder auch die Alternativen, auf deren Weg sie sich mal gemacht haben, vergessen. Und Green Lecture ist deswegen auch ein Austausch zwischen Vordenkern und Praxis, tagespolitischer Praxis. Wir haben zu dieser Green Lecture hier Dorothea Steiner eingeladen, um sich dann zu beziehen auf den Vortrag von Michael Clare, Frau Steiner, so ist es mit Politikerinnen und Politikern, hat nun sehr kurzfristig aus terminlichen Gründen absagen müssen. Das bedauern wir, weil damit ja eine zentrale Intention von Green Lecture heute nicht aufgeht. Ich kann Ihnen nur sagen, damit bleibt umso mehr Zeit für Sie im Publikum mit Michael Claire ins Gespräch zu kommen. Ich werde das Gespräch moderieren. Und eben auch dafür sorgen, dass möglichst viel Austausch äh, mit Michael Claire möglich ist. Ich möchte ihn ganz, ganz herzlich begrüßen, Michael Claire. Wir sind sehr, sehr glücklich und stolz, dass er heute bei uns Gast ist in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. Dankeschön. Er ist einer der wichtigsten, möchte ich sagen, weltweit aktiven Wissenschaftler, die sich seit langem mit dem Zusammenhang von internationaler Friedens- und Sicherheitspolitik und dem Rohstoffrausch und den Rannen auf Ressourcen und vor allem auch der Sicherung von Ressourcen weltweit auseinandersetzt. Er ist äh, zum Beispiel Autor des Buches Blood and Oil. Das kennen vielleicht manche, die sich mit diesen Zusammenhängen von Sicherheitspolitik und Ressourcenpolitik auseinandersetzen. Dieses Buch war unter anderem äh, die Vorlage für einen gleichnamigen Film, Dokumentarfilm, der weltweit wirklich Furore gemacht hat. 
Michael Clare ist Direktor des Five College Programs in Peace and World Security Studies des Hampshire Colleges in Amherst in Massachusetts. Und er ist Autor, da variieren die Angaben zwischen 12 und 14 Büchern. Sie können ja gleich mal sagen, wie viele Sie schon veröffentlicht haben. Und sein jüngstes Buch, uh, The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources, uh, ist 2012 erschienen. Und seinen, sein Vortrag heute wird sich stark auf den Thesen dieses Buches uh, aufbauen. Und er wird uns mehr oder weniger auf der Grundlage dieses Buches davon erzählen, wie er die neuen sicherheitspolitischen Herausforderungen mit der neuen globalen Bonanza der alten und neuen Industrienationen einschätzt. Mit welchen Problemen haben wir es zu tun? Auf Michael Clare geht der Begriff Extreme Energy zurück. Mit diesem Begriff wird, werden Techniken verbunden und Techniken beschrieben, mit denen Energie aus sogenannten nicht konventionellen fossilen Ressourcen gewonnen werden. Ich denke, er wird in seinem Vortrag auch auf dieses Extreme Energy eingehen. Das heißt also, wir werden uns hier auch über seinen Vortrag sehr aktuell mit Fracking, also mit Shale Gas oder Schiefergas auseinandersetzen. Wir werden uns intensiv mit der Ausbeute von Teersanden zum Beispiel in Kanada beschäftigen und natürlich mit all den neu, neu attraktiv gewordenen Offshore-Bohrungen in der Tiefsee oder auch den Bohrungen nach Öl in der Antarktis und der Suche nach Mineralien in prekären auch Ökosystemen mit all den Folgen für die Ökologie und wir werden uns ganz sicherlich auch mit den menschenrechtlichen Folgen, mit den Arbeitsbedingungen derjenigen, die im, im Bergbau unterwegs sind, über den Vortrag von ähm, Michael Clare auseinandersetzen. Dass Michael Clare heute unser Gast ist, ist kein Zufall. Die Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung beschäftigt sich seit vielen, vielen Jahren mit dem Zusammenhang von Ressourcenausbeutung, Menschenrechten, Demokratie. Wir sind, glaube ich, die Stiftung, die sehr viel in den letzten Jahren publiziert hat. Draußen gibt es einen Büchertisch, der einiges zeigt, was wir an Publikationen haben. Und ich glaube, dass unsere 29 Büros, die wir weltweit haben, ein sehr, sehr guter Seismograf sind, dafür, was eigentlich derzeit äh, im Sinne dieser weltweiten Rohstoffbonanza passiert. Es gibt keine Büroleitung, die mir nicht berichtet, wie die Themen um Bergbau, ähm, um ähm, Mineralien, um neue Ölfunde, um den Kohleboom in manchen Ländern ähm, Thema ist vor Ort. Und für uns als Stiftung natürlich genau Auftrag, mehr denn je den Zusammenhang von Demokratie, Stabilität und Sicherheitspolitik und Ressourcenausbeutung äh, mit all den ökologischen und menschenrechtlichen Folgen bekannt zu machen. Wie gesagt, wir freuen uns also, dass Michael Clare heute hier ist. Ich ich wünsche uns allen eine muntere Debatte im Anschluss an seinen Vortrag. And now, Michael Clare, the floor is yours. Thank you once again for coming and joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Barbara, for that nice introduction and for setting the stage for what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, And I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about in a minute. But first, I want to express my, the, the honor that I feel in being chosen to deliver a green lecture at the Heinrich Bull Foundation here in Berlin. It's really a great honor for me because I have such great respect for the work that you do at the foundation. I know of the work that you all do. And to be chosen to be a Green Lecturer is really a great honor, and I'm so happy to be here. Now, for my topic tonight, I'm going to draw on my book, The Race for What's Left, but I'm going to focus in particular on the extraction of hydrocarbons, 
oil and natural gas in particular. And I'm going to argue, try to argue, that because of the stage that we have reached in the extraction of hydrocarbons, the particular stage that we have reached in this process, we are transitioning to a new stage in history, what I'm going to call the third carbon era, the era of unconventional hydrocarbons. So the first thing I'm going to try to do tonight is to persuade you that we're actually entering a new era. Uh, you, may, uh, ha you may not be convinced of this, and that's why I'm glad that we have so much time later for discussion, because what I really look forward to is not hearing myself speak, but having the interaction between us. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion. But I'm going to try to argue that we are entering a new period, which is neither a continuation of the petroleum age, nor, alas, the onset of the age of renewables, as so many of us had hoped would be the case, but something entirely different. And second, I will argue or describe, try to describe, that the dangers presented by this new era are distinctive from those of the past. And then third, I will finish by discussing the steps I think we must all take together to address the dangers that this new era will bring, to minimize them, and to try to shorten as much as possible the age of unconventionals <laughs> so that we can move as rapidly as possible to the age of renewables. So to begin with, let me try to convince you that we are entering a new era of carbon and that it is indeed different enough from the age of petroleum to justify being called a new era. And before I go much further into this, let me say that I've been influenced by other researchers, it's not just me, but others who, whose work has influenced me to move in this direction. Very swiftly, I just want to acknowledge the work of Deborah Gordon of the Carnegie, Carnegie Endowment in Washington, D.C., who taught me that unconventional oils are, in fact, different from the petroleum of the past. And she's published a study called Understanding Unconventional Oil, which you can uh, get from the internet. You could download it. And if you're concerned about this, I urge you to do so. And I also want to acknowledge a debt to my hero, Bill McKibben of Middlebury College in Vermont, the founder of 350.org and the organizer of a campaign against the Keystone XL pipeline. Bill says that we have to spell our planet differently. In English, Earth, with two A's instead of one, to distinguish it, the planet we now inhabit that's been so altered by climate change and pollution to distinguish it from the planet that humans once inhabited in the pre-climate change era. I've drawn from these and other analysts in my presentation tonight, but hope to add my own contribution. Like Deborah Gordon and like Bill McKibben, I believe that something fundamental is happening, something profound that's changing our world in new and dramatic and dangerous ways, something that will alter everything on the planet, now let me also say, by way of beginning, that I believe that energy affects everything. The nature of our energy system shapes everything else in human history and has done so since the beginning of time. The earliest great powers, the Egyptian Empire and the Roman Empire and the other early great empires, depended for their economic and military strength on human mode of power, on human slavery. The Roman Empire 
had great engineers and great economists and great leaders, but they couldn't accomplish anything without massive human slavery. It was human slavery that built the Roman Empire. The great European empires of the 15th and 16th and 17th, 18th century also were powered to a large extent by human slavery as their mode of power. In time, of course, they also mastered the use of wind power and water power, and it was their mastery of wind that allowed the European powers to sail across the oceans and conquer foreign lands to acquire more slaves and other resources for plunder. The onset of the Industrial Revolution began with the mastery of water power to turn mills and factories. But the Industrial Revolution was made possible, of course, by their mastery of coal. And it was coal that established the first carbon age. This was the age of steam power, of railroads, of steamships, of steam-powered industrial manufacturing, and above all, it was the era of the British Empire. At one time, Great Britain was the major producer and consumer of coal, the major world manufacturer, the leading industrial innovator, and the dominant world power. All of these things, in my mind, were interconnected, and they certainly were connected in the minds of people at that time. Germany's rise in the 19th century came by following this industrial model based on coal. Now, the age of coal, as we know, was also the time of growth of the great industrial cities, of smog and pollution, and all that came with that. We think of the grime and pollution of London and Manchester and other great industrial cities built by coal. This was also the beginning of massive human emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the onset of the greenhouse effect. And because it could take up to 70 years for carbon dioxide to migrate from the surface to the outer atmosphere, the climate change we are experiencing today is the product of the first carbon era. So you can imagine that what we're going to contribute in the future, if we see the effects today, this is from the first carbon age. The effects of the second and third have yet to be felt. And while this age has been largely superseded by the second carbon age, the age of petroleum, we shouldn't assume that the age of coal has disappeared. Far from it. If you travel to China and India, coal still prevails as the dominant form of energy. And the grime and the pollution of smog that we would associate with 19th century London is what you find today in Beijing and Shanghai and other cities. On a global scale, however, we've transitioned from the first to the second petrol, the second carbon era, the age of petroleum. Petroleum is now the world's leading source of energy and will remain so for some time to come. And just as coal shaped its era, oil has shaped our age. This is the age of the automobile, of highways, of airplanes, of suburbia, of malls, of mass tourism, mechanized agriculture, plastics, petrochemicals, artificial fibers, <laughs> and all the rest. I'm curious to know why you find this funny. I mean, it's true. It's exhausting. And above all else, this is the age of the rise of the United States as the dominant world power. USA was the world's first power to produce petroleum on a large scale, the first master of oil extraction technology and refining technology, the home of the first great transnational oil corporation, the Standard Oil Corporation, today 
reconstructed as ExxonMobil, the world's most powerful, richest, publicly, uh, uh, privately owned corporation. And the United States was the first and still the most successful power in harnessing oil for the use in warfare. Now, just as the connection of coal and industry and British domination was seen to be interconnected with coal, I think we should understand that all that I just described, the rise of the automobile and aviation, the rise of America, are interconnected with oil. And just as the first carbon age lives on in China and India with the pollution and so forth, so the second carbon era will live, will live on with the superhighways and the malls and, all, and, the, and American military power around the world. But the second carbon era is coming to an end. This era has been powered by conventional oil, oil that comes out of the ground in a liquid form, in a form that can be easily refined into usable products like gasoline and aviation fueled fuel. It comes from easily accessed reservoirs close to the surface in, sh in shallow coastal areas, in nearby locations, in large reservoirs. This is what the industry calls easy oil. You stick a drill in the ground, go and you reach a reservoir, and the underground pressure of the reservoir pushes the oil out. You don't have to use much energy to get it out. It comes rushing out. You collect it. You pipe it to a refinery, and you have a valuable Product, the most valuable product in human history. This is what made possible the expansion of the world economy in the past 65 years, the miracle of economic growth, the great boom of the past 60 years. And let's be very clear, easy oil is disappearing before our eyes. It will be gone in another 25 years. We are running out of it. There will be no more. The day of easy oil is over. Now, I could spend hours discussing this with you. Uh, some people insist that there's more to be found. But uh, I think there's a growing consensus that uh, there is no more to be found. And even conservative analysts at the International Energy Agency now agree. No, I'm not saying that petroleum products are disappearing. I'm saying that easy conventional oil is disappearing, and with it the economy and the politics and all that went with it will vanish. Now, I think many of us hoped that the disappearance of easy oil, conventional oil, would be followed by the onset of the age of renewables. I certainly hope that that would be the case. However, that is not going to happen, not under present circumstances. Instead, we're going to enter something different, the third carbon era, the age of unconventional oil and gas. To quote Deborah Gordon of the Carnegie Endowment, quote, contrary to conventional wisdom, oil is not running out. It is instead changing form, geographically, geologically, chemically, and economically. Now I'm going to explain what she means by this. But before explaining this further, it's essential to note that this is not accidental, this change. It is the result of a determined effort by the major oil and natural gas companies and their backers in government and in finance 
to avert the renewable option and instead to push us in the direction of reliance on unconventional oil and gas at a catastrophic cost to the environment and the people who live on the planet, but at colossal benefit to the oil companies. So now let me explain what these unconventional oils are about. Essentially, there are four types. So spare me just a minute or two to explain what I'm talking about here. First, there are ordinary forms of oil and natural gas. When you extract them, they're they're ordinary oil and gas that are extracted from previously inaccessible unconventional locations, places that previously were out of reach, that were inaccessible using existing technology, but that now become accessible through the use of extraordinary means, what I would call extreme energy. This includes the Arctic and the deep oceans, and these are only accessible by extreme measures. That's one form of unconventional energy. A second form is oil and gas that is extracted from unyielding geological formations. That is not porous rock, but solid rock that has to be shattered using explosive means. Dynamite to blow it apart and water cannon, hydrofracking to extract the oil and gas. Then a third form of unconventionals is premature or degraded petroleum products. This is an oil at all. It can be premature oil, that is uh, organic matter like kerogen trapped in shale that has to be melted to do millions of years of what Mother Nature does in furnaces to, or by sticking iron rods into the earth to melt this organic matter to make it a liquid form, so-called oil shale. Or degraded petroleum, petroleum that has lost all of its lighter molecules and hydrogen that's left a stick thicky carbon-rich mess, uh, which we call tar sands. Now, there could be fourth and fifth categories of unconventional oil and gas uh, by converting coal and natural gas to liquids. That technology is being developed. And a fourth, fifth category uh, out in the future that terrifies me, which is methane hydrates. This is methane gas trapped deep beneath the Earth's uh, ocean surface, way down, uh, tr- Methane gas trapped in ice crystals, and there's enough hydrogen trapped, uh, I'm sorry, enough methane gas trapped in these ice crystals to last us a thousand years, they claim. Of course, if that gets out into the atmosphere, uh, you could kiss human life goodbye forever because it's such a potent greenhouse gas. Until very recently, these various forms of conventional energy, unconventional energy provided a tiny fraction of the world's energy, less than 1% as recently as, say, 1995. But their share is increasing so rapidly that they will soon become a majority, certainly in many major producing countries. According to the latest projections from the U.S. Department of Energy, came out just a few months ago, unconventional crude oil will supply 71% of U.S. domestic crude production by 2035. And unconventional natural gas will provide a staggering 86% of domestic natural gas by 2035. So you get a sense of how rapidly 
from 1%, less than 1% by 1995. How rapidly this is happening. This is happening because the oil and gas industry, backed by their banks and financiers and lenders, are pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into the development of these resources, many, many, many times over what is being devoted to renewable energy. So the, the speed at which these, is being, these are being developed is extraordinary. And as a consequence, they will dominate the world's energy supply for decades to come. Now, having said all of this, uh, the question arises, is this just more of the same? Is this just the oil and gas industry continuing the long trajectory of innovation? You know, they drilled 100 feet below ground, then 200 feet below ground, then 500 feet below ground. They drilled in shallow wells offshore, and then, you know, in deeper water. So is this just more of the same? This is the argument of those in industry and their apologists among the pundit... Well, I won't use that. I don't know if it's in German. Their apologists in academia and in and journalists and the like and others who claim that we should just get used to it. Get used to it. It's just technology being put to use. An example of what I'm talking about is Daniel Jurgen, the most often quoted expert on energy in the New York Times, author of the book The Quest. He says that unconventional oil and gas is just uh, oil and gas that hasn't yet become conventional but will be in time. I quote him, Quote, with the passage of time, unconventional sources of oil in all their variety become a familiar part of the world's petroleum supply. I reject this view. And my, what I, if I accomplish nothing else tonight, I hope I can convince you to reject this notion. We do. Uh, <laughs> all right. I want to argue that the methodology of production and the materials themselves make this something else entirely, not more of the same. In terms of extraction, for example, the methodology of extraction, we're not talking about porous rock formations where the underground pressure feeds the... uh, provides the pressure to to release the oil and gas from the earth. To get oil and gas from shale rock, the fastest growing part of the energy supply, this rock has to be shattered by force, explosive force, whether actual explosives or water cannon in the form of fracking. If we're going into the Arctic, or into the deep oceans, we're talking about areas where it's lethal for humans to step out of protected habitats to carry out these operations. It's deadly to live in those, to exist in those places under most circumstances, which is why I call this extreme energy. In many cases, the areas of production are sulfur-rich, and it's poisonous. You can't, if you breathe the oil that's being extracted, you die instantly. More importantly, though, as Deborah Gordon argues, the resources themselves are different in character with what we're familiar with. If we're talking about tar sands and heavy oil, we're talking about a form of petroleum that has lost much of its energy-rich hydrogen and is composed largely of a coal-like carbon. These resources cannot be refined without significant chemical processing involving the addition 
of dilutants and extra hydrogen before they can even be refined into anything usable. And when refined, produce a coal-like byproduct called petroleum coke, petroleum coke, which like coal, produces large amounts of carbon dioxide, as much carbon dioxide as coal production. So in my view, this is not more of the same. We're in a new universe of energy production, which is why I think this is a new carbon era. Now, all resource production, all energy extraction involves environmental risk. Coal has environmental massive risk, as we know. So does conventional oil. I believe that this third carbon era will have equal, if not greater, environmental risk. In the end, much greater environmental risk. Not to say that coal and oil production don't produce risk, but I want to talk about the distinctive characteristics of the new production, environmentally speaking. Drilling in extreme environments like the Arctic and the deep oceans in Siberia poses a particular risk to the environment because these are areas already under threat from climate change, from chemical pollution, and because the flora and fauna that occupy these areas are already living at the edge of survival. And they have very little resilience and capacity to overcome chemical spills or other unnatural assaults that occur, that might occur from drilling operations. We saw that with the Exxon Valdez spill. They cannot survive intensive industrial scale drilling. And any further drilling in the Arctic is likely to, pre- pre- is likely to prove, prove massively destructive to the species that live in those areas and in Siberia. But it's unconventional, it's drilling for shale that, and for tar sands that particularly should worry us because these cannot be conducted without massive amounts of water. And we're living in a planet where water is increasingly going to be a contested substance because of the need for water to grow food on a planet where population is growing and where climate change is going to diminish the availability of water in many areas. And yet, unconventional energy production is now the fastest growing consumer of water on the planet and is expected to rise substantially in the years ahead in order to support hydrofracking and tar sands production and other forms of unconventional oil and gas. You need water for for all of these activities in massive amounts. It takes up to 10 million gallons of water for one frack and any given fracking operation requires many fracks. And to exploit all of the shale gas and shale oil in the United States is going to require hundreds of thousands of drilling operations multiplied by many fracks, and you get a scale of how much water will be needed. And all of this water, once it's used, is toxic. It cannot be poured back into the water supply. Once it's used, it's poisonous. And this is occurring in populated areas and in farming areas in most cases. So if it leaks into the water supply, it could poison the water supply of heavily populated areas like New York City or intensely farmed areas like Pennsylvania and New York State among others. So it has to be separated and treated. And the capacity in this country to manage, in the United States, I'm not in the United States anymore, sorry, Um, in our country, 
to process all of this poisonous water is non-existent. It is the 21st century petroleum equivalent of nuclear waste. That's the way you have to think about it. We do not have, at this point, any capacity to store and process all of this wastewater, poisonous wastewater from fracking, nor is there any sign that there will be in the future. And now I want to come to the biggest problem of all, which is the carbon dioxide emissions that come from this, because that's our greatest worry. Now, there are those who say that shale gas should be welcomed because it's replacing coal in the production of energy in the United States. This indeed is the view of the Obama administration and the new Secretary of Energy. We should welcome this. And we, therefore, we have to take a look at this. There are a lot of reasons why we should be very skeptical of this argument. First of all, shale gas production itself appears to be much more hazardous in the sense of releasing greenhouse gas emissions than was first thought because of the risk of methane gas leakage at the production site. I won't go into all of the details, but there are now a lot of studies showing that in the, in the process of extracting gas, and methane leaks into the atmosphere, and you only need a little bit of methane leakage, methane being far more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, and you wipe out all the gains from eliminating coal. And that appears to be the case. Secondly, all of these operations require far more energy consumption, uh, tar sands in particular, but all of them involve huge amounts of energy expenditure for drilling, for trucking, for heating water, in the case of tar sands. So you're producing more carbon dioxide. Third, the petroleum part of this is trending towards more and more carbon intense sources of oil, as I explained. So the more you use tar sands or heavy oil as a share of the total, the more carbon dioxide will be released in the process. But the fourth part, the most scandalous aspect of this all, is the claim that, that, that the shale gas is a bridge to a green future. That is the expression that is used, that this is just, let us have shale gas, and in another 25 or 50 years, uh, we, then we could transition to green. This is a deception and a lie. What we're getting is a transition to an indefinite spiral of hydrocarbon production. It's the opportunity costs that are being lost. The investment is all being channeled into oil and gas production, not into renewables. So this is a scandal. And I, much I admire about President Obama, but he seems to have fallen for this argument. So the bottom line in all of this is that we're moving to a much more destructive environment and a hotter environment as a result of this. And I think it therefore is a new era and a more destructive one. I was going to talk about the geopolitical implications of this, but I'll save that for your questions. What I wanted to finish with is some thoughts about how do we respond. I think you already are, heard my first point, which is we have to reject the notion that unconventionals are business as usual, more of the same. We have to make clear to everyone that this is something new and different and dangerous and unacceptable. And 
I think that there has to be a much greater amount of education and teaching about extreme energy and the greater risk that we face by allowing this. Second thing I I think we have to do is to build alliances among the victims of all of these modes of production. As I've tried to suggest, all of these modes of production involve an intensified assault on the environment. By definition, they are more destructive of the environment. And in the process, there will be more victims, human victims. If you attack the Arctic in greater numbers, this is going to be destructive of the last humans who practice, in the northern latitudes anyway, who still practice a traditional way of life, the Inuits, Eskimos, and other people of northern Siberia, northern Scandinavia, Greenland, and elsewhere whose way of life is at risk. Drilling in the deep waters is going to lead to more spills, and this threatens the way of life of fisher people, fishing peoples, and coastal peoples, as we saw in the Gulf of Mexico. Hydrofracking is going to pose an immense threat, is already posing an immense threat to the way of life of farmers and ranchers in North Dakota and Pennsylvania and other areas. Wait till it starts in China, in Poland, and in Europe, in South Africa and Argentina. The numbers of victims of this whose water will be polluted and made toxic will be in huge numbers. And there will be the people who are in the way of pipelines and the refineries who will be exposed to the pollution and the spills and the toxic air and all the rest. We have to build coalitions of victims of all of this and make movements of resistance. And we're beginning to see that. The movement that my hero Bill McKibben has created against the Keystone XL pipeline has brought together native people from Canada with ranchers in North Dakota, farmers from Pennsylvania, environmentalists from all across the United States to protest in Washington, D.C. This is the sort of protest movement that we need. And we have to make that international. Third thing we have to do is to stop the process wherever possible. Stopping the Keystone XL is the most important thing we can do. I think President Obama is going to approve it for geopolitical reasons, which if you ask me, I'll explain why. Uh, But other pipelines can be stopped. The government of British Columbia, which the second major pipeline, the Northern Gateway, to take tar sands to the Pacific for delivery to Asia. British Columbia government has said, no way, we're not going to let you cross our territory. And, and the native people of British Columbia has said, we will resist to the last drop of blood in our people before we'll let you do that. So I think that pipeline has been stopped. And other pipelines um, that will go to the Atlantic coast will meet massive resistance in Vermont, North New, uh, New, uh, New Hampshire, and Maine, the terminus. Uh, Yoko Ono is organizing a campaign in New York State to prevent the legalization of hydrofracking there. And there are movements in Europe against fracking. All of this has to be stepped up. And finally, um, we have to defund carbon extraction. And here again, I highlight the work of Bill McKibben in organizing a divestment campaign at American colleges and universities. My college, Hampshire College, has said it will not invest in companies that suck up carbon from the ground for the purpose of, product, of, of carbon extraction. 
and more and more colleges and universities in the United States have divestment campaigns, that is to say, no investment in carbon co corporations, making the analogy to the anti-apartheid movement when colleges and universities and then pension funds and city governments, municipal governments, took their money out of corporations that invested in South Africa. Now we're saying no investment in carbon corporations. And I think this is what we must do, is defund the investments in these unconventional oil and gas operations. So to conclude, I think the renewable age will come. It will come in time because we have no choice. The question is how soon. If we wait another 25 years, the damage done to the planet will be irrevocable. We have to make it come sooner. And therefore, the struggle against these unconventional forms of oil and gas are absolutely crucial, the most important thing we can do. And I, I just feel more strongly than ever we have to make this the centerpiece of everything else. So I will finish with that thought. Um, I hope that from all that I said, you will find things to question me about, to please challenge me on anything I've said, ask me to defend my position or to uh, elaborate, but I welcome now your uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much for listening. to continue in German, if you allow me. Okay. Ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank, Michael, für diese, wie ich finde, sehr aufrüttelnde, informative ähm, Vortrag, den Sie uns gegeben haben. Sie haben mehr geleistet, als nur davon, uns davon zu überzeugen, dass wir unkonventionelle fossile Energien ablehnen sollen. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Wir haben uns das jetzt in der Tat so vorgestellt, dass ich noch die ein oder andere Frage an Michael Claire stellen werde und dann Sie dran sind mit Ihren Fragen oder auch Kommentaren. Ich finde es auch sehr gut, dass Michael Claire bereits ja auch ein paar strategische Aufgaben für uns und was wir tun sollen uns mit auf den Weg gegeben haben. Vielleicht können wir dem auf jeden Fall auch Zeit widmen. Wir erleben ja auch Deutschland und uns selbst ähm, gerade in der Situation, wo bestimmte Protagonisten der Energiekonzerne und auch der schwarz-gelben Regierung uns Fracking in Deutschland verkaufen wollen. Ähm, mich würde jetzt als erste Frage an Sie int noch mal interessieren, dass Sie etwas genauer beschreiben, mit welchen Politiken und mit welchem Lobbydruck es die Ölkonzerne und die großen Energiekonzerne geschafft haben, die Grundlage zu schaffen dafür, dass ganz offensichtlich ähm, die Ausbeutung von äh, unkonventionellen fossilen Energien so durchsetzbar geworden ist auf der politischen Ebene. Was sind die Machtstrukturen? Welche Konzerne sind es? Das ist, glaube ich, ein bisschen zu kurz gekommen. Das wäre meine erste Fra Bitte zu ergänzen, wirklich nur zu ergänzen. Wer sind die Akteure, die Driving Forces? Hello. Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, fracking. You're asking about fracking. F fr yeah. And yeah. Who is behind the tar sands? Who is behind the fracking uh, activity? I'll start fr fracking. I'll start with fracking. Fracking was originally developed by small companies, not the major companies. Small companies independent companies that saw an opportunity uh, to develop resources that, that they were driven out by the major companies. The major companies were looking elsewhere. So these smaller companies developed the technology of fracking and some of them went out of business um, until, some, until some small companies managed 
to find a way to do this. And then the smaller companies were bought up by middle-sized companies. And then the sharks moved in. So uh, one of the medium-sized companies is called XTO Energy, which, which bought up a lot of acreage in Pennsylvania and in Texas. And that was bought up two years ago by ExxonMobil because they saw this as an opportunity for them. So it's been a process of consolidation by the bigger companies. And now Total and BP and all the others are moving into fracking because they see this as the future. Um, now, how do they convince a people to move ahead with this? And, and this becomes political economy. And it's a combination of economic salesmanship and geopolitical salesmanship. So the economic salesmanship is that shale gas provides cheaper energy to American corporations. Uh, so it's going to attract industry away from you Europeans. We're going, to, we're going to steal companies away and provide jobs to Americans. And this is the, and you whisper that into the ear of politicians like President Obama, and he says, yes, do whatever you want. And on top of that, then you take shale, that's shale gas. And, he's, and they say, and, and it's clean energy, it's green energy. And then that's shale gas. Then shale oil, he said, they say, and this will make us independent of those nasty Arabs and th those nasty Africans. You can't trust them. They're Muslim. They're, is they're Islamic. Uh, and we can be energy independent. And, we, and the combination of this is that America will avert the decline that everyone predicted. So if you read the literature of political science two or three years ago was that America is on decline, China's on the rise. That's not the language anymore. The language now is the United States is the new superpower again because of this energy. So in Washington, there's a new consensus. Frack the hell out of the place. <laughs> I swear to you. Uh, because this is going to re-energize the United States as a great power. The only, the only problem is that it's going to in involve the environmental destruction of our own country. Um, is there any research or development, research and development going on to come to, cl to a close uh, cycle when it comes to the toxic water? Is there anything going, taking place to make a close circle? Yes, there, tr there, there, are, there are efforts to, to do this, but the scale is so large and it's so problematic that, I mean, the scale is growing faster than the, the ability to solve the problem. So now, if you enter, if you're not me, if you're not, and you're not part of the green opposition, if you're in the uh, mainstream center, if you're in the center, they are saying, like President Obama, they are saying, well, yes, there are environmental risks, but what we have to do is to make this safe. We can make it safe with regulations. Well, first of all, their companies are doing everything they possibly can to prevent this from happening, and there's no evidence that they're ever going to allow it. But even if you make it safe, I, have, I mean, you have to understand that this is process is very different from conventional drilling. Now, let me say two things about it to make this clear to people. First is that during the Bush administration, when the last legislation, energy, was adopted in 2005, they passed something called the Halliburton Exception under Dick Cheney's uh, supervision, which exempts fracking from federal clean water legislation. Yes, and they leave it up to the states to regulate. 
So I don't know what it's like in Germany. Maybe it's the same. Uh, but in the United States, if you leave something up to the states, the states are much more corruptible. So in the case of Pennsylvania, the government, I'm quoting people from who work on this, the state legislature is in the pocket of the oil and gas industry. They're bought. You know, they're so heavily lobbied and bought, paid for, that they do whatever the oil and gas industry wants. Now, that's not the case in New York State. So, so New York State has resisted. So you have good states. Then you have Texas and Pennsylvania. Um, and that, they want to keep it that way. The industry wants to keep it that way. And so far, there's no success. And with Republicans in the House, there will not be, and it looks like it'll stay that way, there will not be federal regulations. Uh, the other thing I want to say, one, one more thing about this, you can get a company that will abide, that will have good practice, but there are dozens of companies, and to successfully extract the gas of the Marcellus formation, you're going to need 50,000, 100,000 wells because fracking is not like conventional oil and gas. We have one well, and it scoops up from hundreds of thousands of square acres. You need one per mile. Decentralized energy. Very decentralized energy. And each one, each one has to be perfect. You just need one out of 50,000 to have a slip-up. And you can poison the water supply for thousands of people. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for uh, um, that uh, uh, insight, yeah. what's going on in the United States. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the audience will get back to that issue because I think it's a burning issue uh, around fracking. But I would like to, to, to bring in a further dimension. Uh, you already told us that you can't go because of the time uh, constraints into the geopolitics. But I think uh, the audience is very much interested uh, more on a global, uh, global level. What, how do you see the sh power shifts taking place around the globe in the context of the scramble for resources. I think that would be interesting because you are a researcher and a scientist uh, for many, many years looking into the linkage between security policies, foreign policies, and uh, the resource uh, issue. Do you see a certain trends, global trends, taking place in the context of emerging economies and the old industrialized countries do continue to look for getting access to a broad level of any kind of resources from fossil fuels to minerals? Yeah. Well, that would and take... I will open that, to that's, the that's another green lecture, yeah. I'm afraid. But, but, but some trends, probably. Some trends, yes. I, I gave you part of the story already. Mm -hmm. um, there is a new... Washington consensus on on the revival of American power and uh, associated with this is the containment of Russia and the containment of China and this reflects the shift in the strategic thinking of the Obama administration from a focus on the Middle East which be which now is no longer the center, central strategic concern as it was in previous administrations because of American dependence on imported oil, especially from the Middle East. That disappears in this new equation. The U.S. no longer requires Middle Eastern oil and the amount, or it, it a certain amount, but it's declining very rapidly in this scenario. So the U.S. can afford to to diminish its strategic presence in the Persian Gulf area, which it's doing. On the other hand, China is becoming very rapidly more dependent on the Persian Gulf 
and on Africa for resources. And I believe that the Obama administration and others in Washington see this as a strategic vulnerability because all these resources have to travel by sea on global sea lanes. And these are sea lanes controlled not by the Chinese Navy, but by the American Navy. So the Obama administration is moving American military power from land to sea to control the sea lanes in the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea, the Strait of Malacca, and the East China Sea, and to rebuild its alliance with its naval uh, allies, Philippines, Singapore, Japan, and others that support this naval concentration. This, in turn, has made China very frightened and is pushing China... Uh, to rebuild it, to to uh, build up its navy, to turn to Russia for weapons, um, and creating a kind of a naval arms race environment. It's heightened tensions between China and Japan over these offshore islands. I think all these things are interrelated. Uh, the U.S. also wants Europe to frack as well. Poland, Ukraine, so it's less dependent on Russia to squeeze Russia of revenues from shale, from its gas exports. This is the way uh, Washington strategists see the world. Uh, this sounds very classical. Competition, competition is dominating um, the global uh, policies. But aren't there some joint interests between emerging economies and um, industrialized countries? Um, do you see common ground, for example, um, rejecting ambitious climate reductions, for example? I think there are two pictures, yeah? There is competition, and, uh, but there might be as well cooperation in the global politics. How do you look at this? Well, of course, I want to see it, but I don't. Gary, do you have any? Uh, uh, that's because of, you know, I, I say that energy is the defining force in human affairs. And at this moment, I see this energy revolution of unconventionals being the most dynamic ac event, not climate change, mm -hmm. not other, not certainly not renewable energy, but this is appears to be for now. I don't know how long it will last, but the most dynamic, the, the, the most dynamic force in world affairs today, economically and politically, and it's as I see it, it's very negative. I wish I could be convinced otherwise. So anybody who wishes to challenge me and find flaws in my argument will make me happy. Exactly. That's a very good transition to the audience. Um, ich möchte Sie bitten, um, sich zu melden. Wir brauchen Mikro wegen der Übersetzung. Sie können auf Deutsch sprechen oder auf Englisch. Das Mikro kommt zu Ihnen. Versuche, den Überblick zu behalten. Bitte sagen Sie ganz kurz, wer Sie sind. Und der Herr hat sich zuerst gemeldet, in der Tat. Um, thank you. My name is Gunnar Demuth. Michael Clare, there was a president in the United States about 30 years ago, Jimmy Carter, and uh, uh, he really was convinced of the renewables, but he was not very successful. So um, can you imagine any political, um, any co political leader who really may influence the way of energy policy of uh, um, the economy of the United States? Um, as Jimmy Carter was not successful, I don't have so much hope that uh, somebody can change the politics in the United States. Thank you. I can't conceive of anybody at the national level 
having that effect. Um, Jimmy Carter was undone by by the development in the 19, or his initiatives were undone by precisely what we're seeing today. His initiatives were undone by the discovery and develop of massive new supplies of easy oil. Uh, I shouldn't say it wasn't entirely easy, but by, by new reserves of North, North Sea oil, uh, Alaska oil, and African oil, produced massive amounts of oil, and the price of oil dropped, and Americans went on a binge of SUV buying, and the, the, uh, all of those initiatives were canceled. And President Obama, when he came into office, announced many similar initiatives. And today, they are all being abandoned or, or pushed aside, I should say, for precisely the same reason. We're being flooded with cheap energy because of the shale gas and the shale oil from North Dakota. So as long as that lasts, it, I think it will be impossible to turn that aside. Okay, Michael, would you allow me to collect a few questions? Yes, because but there don't are many. Forget our friend, friend. No, I won't. But she I... Has to leave. Who has to leave? You. Okay. Zuerst mal Peter Fuchs dran, der hat sich schon ganz früh gemeldet und dann gehen wir hier vor. Sie sind, ich versuche alle dran zu kriegen. Peter Fuchs Aha. vom PowerShift. Der Name ist inspiriert von den PowerShift-Aktiven in den USA. Zwei kurze Fragen. Herr Klär, Ihre strategischen wait, Orientierungen... Wait a minute. Er, er hat die Ver Übersetzung verloren. Or should I do it in English? No, do it in German. It's working now. I mean, for the benefit of our guest, I'll do it in English, of course. That's fine. My name is Peter Fuchs. I'm from a German organization called PowerShift. The name is inspired by activists in the US. Two quick questions. First, on your strategic orientation, there wasn't a positive agenda because you wanted to focus on shale gas and the resistance that is there. But isn't also um, the energy transition that is happening in Germany, hopefully in China and elsewhere, making it economically more difficult for the shale gas industry and others um, with the, well, carbon bubble that may be building up? I'd like to hear your your view on this, whether economically they can really um, get away with this strategy of the third carbon generation if we manage to bring about an energy transition even faster than now. The second question relates to liquefied natural gas, the LNG industry inter interests in the US and elsewhere that, among others, uh, pushed a lot for a new geoeconomics on energy, partially That is also a reason for the trade and investment agreement that is now coming up between the US and the EU. We understand, at least from the literature, that LNG firms in the US don't want to stick to their old promise to Obama that it's bringing jobs and, and <laughs> low-carbon energy. They now want to export it, and they want to go global and to Europe with their liquefied natural gas. Is that a discussion happening in the U.S., uh, really, and how, what do you make of it? And isn't that another reason to be opposed to that transatlantic trade and investment agreement? Thank you. Could you still get the recorder, Mike? The jet. Okay, thank you for reacting. Bedeutet aber noch mal fünf Fragen auf einmal. Es waren keine zwei, Peter. Yeah, Ist schon okay. One, one question per person, so. One question per person, okay. But would you like to, 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 to give an answer to the... I'll do my best. I mean, those are good and important questions. And I, I would like to do them justice, but I can't spend all, all, all day. I don't know enough about Germany. I want to hear, I want to see the latest data from Germany, just how, what the trajectory looks like. How is nuclear power, the, when, when nuclear power is replaced, to what degree is it going to be replaced with renewable energy and to what degree is it going to be replaced with coal? 
um, oil and natural gas. And I have to see the real data before I could answer you. I know there's a transition underway. It's very impressive. I admire it greatly, but I'm a little bit dubious that it's going in the direction that I would really like to see. So I got to see the data. And on the second question, that's a very interesting one causing a huge fight in the United States, a very interesting fight. The price of natural gas is so low now that, as I explained, it's becoming a magnet for new industrial investment in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and that area creating new jobs. So big energy users like refineries and um, aluminum smelters and petrochemical companies are setting up shop in Pennsylvania, creating new jobs because they could get cheap energy. And they are lobbying Obama against permitting LNG exports. The, and they want to keep the price of gas low. The LNG, the, the uh, oil and gas companies like ExxonMobil, which, as I said, bought heavily into this, want to export to Europe and Japan because they could get a much higher price, which would drive up the price in the United States. So they would get rich, but it would undermine the industrial competitiveness in the United States. So this is a battle intensely being fought, uh, which is interesting because it's an inter-industrial war taking place. And it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out. I don't know the answer to that yet. Fine. So, jetzt gehen wir hier rüber, da sind zwei, und dann gehen wir auf die Seite. Jetzt. Yeah, thank you, Astrid Schneider from the German Green Party as well. Um, I have uh, one remark to, to what you have said about the data from Germany, maybe to give one answer as well. Uh, in the electricity sector, we are actually really uh, substituting nuclear power by renewables. We are doing that. Uh, but we have a little bit more coal now used than gas before. So we have a shift in the fossil sector, mm. which gives a little bit more CO2 at the moment. But the nuclear power is, is substituted by renewables. And um, But I have questions to you as well. Um, I told before I'm... Hmm? Yeah, well, she said... Yeah? She from the Energy Watch Group as well. And the Energy Watch Group continues saying with their studies that there is a shale gas boom and a shale oil boom, but that it is not that big to make a long-term shift in the energy pattern of the United States. So it is a bubble of maybe 10 years or something with a plateauing very soon and then going down. And as well, I heard many doubts about the economic um, economy of the shale gas and shale oil, so that it's so cheap because it's not, not connected to the international market, but that they are not making a lot of earnings. But some companies already went bankrupt and so on. So yes, those are the questions. These, are, these are questions. I, I try to follow this as best as I possibly can, and it changes from week to week the analysis of this. And my understanding is that the amount of resources is, keeps growing, not diminishing. That uh, they keep finding more. That the amount of shale, whether for oil or gas, is gr greater than anybody ever believed. And that the technology to extract it is, is becoming more and more capable all the time. So that uh, there's the, the, the bubble, the, there could be the price issue, which is why, why they do want to export it. You're absolutely right. They want to export it to drive up profits. Smaller companies are going bankrupt. But the question, the question of how soon the bubble is going to burst in terms of quantity, from what I could tell, there's just huge amounts of it. And... China has more than the United States, and so do other countries. Whether it will all be extracted is another story. This will be a political decision, not a geological decision. So, that, and it'll, it, it may be water is the resource that's most in 
the, yeah, the limiting factor may prove to be water, not shale. But the amount of shale on the planet is mammoth. They just discovered a new shale formation in North Dakota underneath the one they're now tapping from that's apparently bigger than the one that they're already developing. They drilled down through the existing one and they found another one. So whether this is hype, I'm not enough of trained geologists to say, but all of the accounts seem to suggest there's more. Gut, jetzt helfen Sie mir noch mal da. Genau, ist die Dame ist dran, sie. Dann sie und dann gehen wir mal hier rüber. Ich muss sie kommen alle dran, versprochen. My name is Ursula Roland. Dann geht's hier hin. How come the oil is so cheap when so much energy is needed to extract it and to process it? That I don't understand. What is the ratio of energy put in to extract and process it and the energy you get out of it in the end? This, this is, this is a, a question that is hard to answer exactly because it depends on what form of energy you're talking about. Um, and, for example, if you're talking about tar sands, the energy that's being put in is natural gas. It could also be coal, because you're heating water. The, the, hard, the hard part is to heat water to melt the bitumen in the ground, and you can heat that with cheap natural gas to produce, you're using a lot of energy, but you're using cheap energy and you're getting out liquid energy oil, which could be sold, which is in, you know, now three times, four times more valuable on the international market. So there's, it's a question of what energy, you're, what form of energy you're using and what form you're receiving at the other end. If oil is 100, over $100 a barrel and you can use energy that's, $50 a barrel or less equivalent, you're making a lot of money. So you, so even if it's a lot of energy you're using, if it's cheaper energy, it's profitable. And they're going to do it. They're just going to do it. Uh, but you're right. There's a lot of energy use in this. But so long as they can make a profit, doesn't matter. Okay, jetzt gehen wir mal kurz auf diese Seite. Du bist dran. Der Mann mit dem Pflaster. Ja, mein Name ist Hartwig Berger. Uh, I excuse that I'm speaking uh, German. I don't uh, speak English. Also, uh, auch von den Grünen. Ich habe eine um, Bemerkung um, und eine kritische Frage. Die Bemerkung ist vielleicht... Um, ist in der Situation aus der USA hier gesehen, ihre Einschätzung zu pessimistisch, was andere Länder betrifft. Ich kenne zumindest die Situation sehr gut in Frankreich. Ein enormer Widerstand gegen das Fracking-Gas. Ein enormer Widerstand. Ich halte es dafür nicht durchsetzbar. In Deutschland ist meine optimistische Einschätzung ähnlich, sodass ich annehme wenn ich Ihre pessimistische Einschätzung für die USA teile, dass wir dann wohl geopolitisch, was der Umgang mit Energie kommt, in eine geteilte Welt kommen. Und dann wird sich zeigen, ob in Europa vollständig der Übergang auf erneuerbare Energien gemacht wird oder die nukleare Linie, von der wissen Sie, in Frankreich und England auch weiter verfolgt wird. Und meine zweite kritische Bemerkung ist, also das war jetzt nur eine Ergänzung, meine zweite kritische Bemerkung. Ähm, es gibt ja, äh, die schließt an Astrid Schneider an, an das eben. Ich äh, kenne, habe auch Artikel gelesen aus den USA, die folgendes sagen. Äh, die ganze Einschätzung mit den Unconventional Energies ist viel zu optimistisch, was die voraussehbaren Kosten betrifft. Und die These ist dann die, dass die USA mit ihrer Politik der Extreme Energies 
in eine neue Verschuldungskrise kommen, weil die Investitionen in immer schwerer erschließbare Quellen so hoch sind, dass die Firmen dann schließlich, ich spitze es zu, Insolvenz anmelden müssen, jedenfalls ihre Investitionen nicht mehr bezahlt kommen, beziehungsweise die Energiepreise so hoch gehen, dass sich das Ganze auch nicht rentiert. Hätte ich gerne Ihre Stellungnahme zu diesen Thesen. Thank you for those good questions. And let me, st let me start from the position that I held your views until very recently. Uh, but I've been reading the industry literature and I came to the view that for our own best interests, it is better to, to be more cautious and pessimistic for now. And I, I, was, I was talking before with my colleagues here at the foundation. It, it, eventually, what you say is true. Eventually, this oil and gas explosion of unconventionals will collapse. If it were to collapse in the next five years, we can breathe a sigh of relief because then we will have time to make the transition worldwide to renewable energy. But if it lasts 15 or 20 years, we will face a planetary catastrophe because the amount of additional carbon will be so vast. So I don't want us to err on the side of optimism in this case, and therefore not fight hard enough against this. Do you see what I'm saying? I think it's better to assume the worst and to, to fight it as hard as we possibly can. Because right now the signs are it's going to last for another 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. That's the way it looks today. The amount of money being put into this is easily a trillion dollars in the next decade alone. A trillion dollars worldwide. And I don't know how much is going into renewables, but it's certainly nowhere near that much. Okay. Uh, um, but I didn't finish. And I have nothing but respect for Europe. But let's be realistic. In 2035, the US and Canada and Mexico and Brazil and India and China together are going to be about 75% of world energy consumption. And they are moving in this direction lockstep together. And despite what the gentleman said earlier about China, That yes, they are investing in renewables, but they are investing far more in fossil fuels. And they are planned to make shale gas the center of their energy policy. That is the plan of the Communist Party, far more than renewables. So I'm not optimistic about China, certainly not optimistic about India. Yes, they are all investing in renewables, but the direction in the rest of the world is not the direction of Europe, much as I bless you. So we have to, we have to face reality. And that means building a worldwide movement against carbon, including China. Because young people in China, I think, understand the perils. Okay, there are a few more questions. Zuerst gehen wir hier hin, dann die Dame und dann gehen wir darüber. Mein Name, mein Name ist Frank Wende. Ich habe zwei Fragen an Sie. Ich möchte gerne wissen, ob wir nicht mit den normalen Erdölvorkommen, die man findet, abgesehen jetzt vom äh, Schieferöl, äh, was es wohl in rauen Mengen gibt, 
äh, doch äh, vorsichtiger umgehen müssen, denn eines Tages wird es keine normalen Erdölvorkommen mehr geben. Das, wir haben da einen Schrumpfungsprozess. Ebenso äh, möchte ich mal zu sprechen kommen auf die seltenen Metalle, die man äh, findet, äh, besonders in China und auch im stillen Ozean, die wir für die Chipindustrie benutzen, für Computer etc. Auch da müssen wir etwas drosseln, denn es gibt also äh, Selen und Tellur und so weiter, die man dafür verwendet. Auch da müssten wir wohl etwas drosseln, denn so viel Vorkommen gibt es da nicht. Ja, danke auch für die Erweiterung der Rohstoffe, nicht nur fossile, sondern auch nochmal um die Metalle. You would like to ask, answer? This, this is the subject of my new book, The Race for What's Left, that makes exactly this argument. Thank you. Sabine Schäffer, Journalist. Um, Sie sagten vorhin, dass ähm, Amerika in Zukunft ähm, mehr Militär in, ähm, auf, zu den Seewegen schickt, um die Seewege zu sichern. Ich habe im Spiegel gelesen vor einem Jahr, das Gegenteil wäre richtig. Amerika hat keinerlei Interesse daran, die Seewege weiter zu sichern, weil sie nicht mehr davon profitieren. Amerika braucht keine Seewege mehr, um Energie zu transportieren und ähm, zieht das Militär aus diesem Gebiet zurück. Ist das, was Sie jetzt sagen, der aktuellste Stand? Der Artikel im Spiegel ist ein Jahr lang äh, alt. Ähm, oder ähm, hat Amerika einfach die Strategie geändert, um jetzt Militär dahin zu schicken, obwohl es kein Eigeninteresse mehr hat, die Seewege zu sichern? Und der Spiegel stellte dann die Frage, wer wird das in Zukunft machen, wenn Amerika sich zurückzieht aus der Sicherung der Seewege, weil kein Interesse daran besteht und es einfach nur teuer ist, wer wird dann da diese Gebiete sichern? Also China, es wird dann eine Machtverschiebung geben? Do you know what Spiegel is? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what der Spiegel said. So I can't respond to that. But the strategy of the Obama administration is to strengthen American naval capacity, particularly in the Pacific. Um, they're moving. Uh, previously, the division was 50% of U.S. naval strength in Europe and the Mediterranean and 50% in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. So now they're moving to 60% strength in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and 40% in Europe and the Mediterranean. So there will be some reduction of U.S. naval strength in the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean, but it's because they're moving those forces to the Pacific and they're building up U.S. naval capacity to fight in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, the Straits of Malacca. This is U.S. strategy now. I, I don't know what Der Spiegel said. They built them up actually. Yes. Yes, yeah. okay. Capacities. Yeah. What the U.S. is not doing is it's diminishing its ground warfare capacity mm -hmm. in the Middle East but not to protect, the, for example, the Strait of Hormuz. And if you understand, no, they, the Iranians have threatened to close the Strait of Hormuz between the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean in retaliation for any attack on Iranian nuclear facilities. And uh, President Obama, well, or not Obama personally, but the head of the uh, U.S., military forces, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has said, we have the capacity and we will take action, whatever is necessary to maintain freedom of navigation through the Strait of Hormoz. And they are conducting exercises constantly for that purpose. Now, uh, one of the interesting discussions is Uh, people say, well, China's a beneficiary of this. 
uh, in English, uh, they are free riders. You know, they get a free pass. They don't have to protect. Uh, But the Chinese also see this as a tremendous vulnerability, which explains why China is paying huge amounts of money to build pipelines to Central Asia, to Russia, that don't go by sea. These are not economically viable pipelines. It makes much more sense to come by sea. But they are frightened of uh, U.S. capacity to sever their sea lanes. So they are building up their alliances with Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and the pipelines, and with Russia, moving closer to Russia, which I think is a negative international development. Uh, But precisely for this reason, their fear for the safety of their sea lanes. Gut, ich möchte jetzt noch mal, also hier ist noch eine Wortmeldung. Wie viele Wortmeldungen gibt es noch? Die würde ich jetzt gerne alle dran nehmen. Ja, okay. Vor allem hier auf dieser... Sie, nee, der Herr war dran, der wartet schon sehr lange. Und dann... Ja. Genau. Ähm, Bär mein Name. Ähm, vielleicht eine kleine Vorgeschichte. Nach der Maueröffnung sind mir meine Elterngeneration entgegengelaufen, ebenfalls mit Weltuntergangsstimmungen. Als die Euro-Einführung kam... 2003, 2, wie auch immer, oder 4, kam auch meine Elterngeneration mir meine Arme gelaufen, auch mit halbwegs großen Sorgen und Weltuntergangsstimmungen. Wenn ich mir die Geschichten noch mal Revue passieren lasse, kaum davon etwas, was von denen erzählt wurde, ist in dieser Zeit Nähe aufgetreten, als was man mir vorgegeben hat. Also wir haben vielleicht auch ein Problem der zeitlichen Einschätzung. Ähm, was will ich damit sagen? Ich will dahin sagen, dass es sagen, kann es sein, dass durch die Transparentisierung, die stattfindet, Erdplanetar, noch ein Mitspieler eintritt, den sie vernachlässigt haben? Nämlich, wir wollen ja nicht die ganzen jungen Menschen verheizen, wie es in der Vergangenheit Politik gerne gemacht hat, sondern wäre es dann nicht sinnvoll, wir können zurückgucken auf die Maueröffnung und auf die Wirkkräfte, die freigesetzt wurden, wir können auf die Euro-Einführung und auf die Wirkkräfte und wir können auf die Kriege, die geführt werden, hier teilweise territorial und die Wirkkräfte recht gut messen. Also was will ich sagen? Sollten wir, sollten wir vielleicht einen, ähm, einen Wettbewerb im Lernen der Regierungen auf dieser Erde statt, äh, erkennen, der stattfindet, obwohl es bisher vielleicht nicht so der Fall war, was ja auch nicht war, möglich war wegen dem Kalten Krieg, dass wir hier also einen Wettbewerb haben der Regierungen, sie müssen schneller lernen, als wie das Chaos sich entwickelt ist das, eine, ist das eine Sache, die man mit betrachten muss? Und so zum Zweiten, was Ihren Pessimismus betrifft, dachte ich, äh, da gehe ich nochmal in die eine Kerbe, die der Herr vorhin erklärt hat. Sie haben meines Erachtens nach was riesig Positives gesagt, wo jeder Wirtschaftler sagen würde, Mensch, so viel Positives kann man ja gar nicht berichten. Sie sagen, dass das, was da frackingmäßig, sprich neu äh, energietechnisch da auf die Beine gestellt wird, unwahrscheinlich viel Aufwand und Investitionen kostet. Dass ich sage, rentabilitätstechnisch gesehen absolut kontraproduktiv. Umgekehrt sagen Sie was anderes. Die alten Energien waren leicht zu bergen und lassen sich noch leicht nutzbar machen und veräußern. Also sprich, Sie sagen, was ich da sagen will, ist, kommt diesen Investoren, die in diese äh, ähm, Fracking-Variante da äh, hinein investieren, nicht ein gigantischer äh, ähm, Lernzwang auf, wir können da doch nur gelassen uns in die Sitze setzen und zugucken, wie die sich höchstwahrscheinlich von Realitäten überrollen lassen müssen, weil es einfach nicht langfristig rentabel ist, was sie da vorhaben. Ja. I, I think you're probably right in the long run. As I, as I explained, the question is, how long is the long run? And what will happen in the meantime? That's the essence of, of the argument. In the long run, you're right. Uh, in the long run, the whole system will prove uneconomic and people will turn against it. But if it lasts 25 years, the consequences will be so bad in the meantime that we can't afford that. And in the meantime, they emit a lot of methane and CO2 emissions yeah, well, and we cannot afford this if we I want meant. to stay within the planetary boundaries yeah. and and the two degree world yeah, yeah? And this that, is i think the most urging problem yeah that's that's what i meant yeah. right okay sie sind dran genau die dame mit dem schönen dut vielen dank 
my question relates to his question. I would be interested in the consequences on the stock market. I came across a thesis that um, companies in the future um, will be massively over-evaluated by analysts and a great bubble, a great bubble will be happening. Um, so have you got any information on this topic? I don't have information on that topic. Um, I understand that this is a point of discussion. And um, as I said in my remarks, there is a drive among young people in particular on college campuses in the United States to get uh, colleges and universities to divest their endowment to sell their stocks in these carbon companies, these oil and gas and coal companies. And colleges and universities don't have that a, a whole lot of money, but then if pension funds have a lot of money invested in those companies, that could have that effect. So in my mind, this is, this is something that we have to pursue. But until that happens, I don't know whether in fact that impact you describe will be felt. So, yes, you're absolutely right to raise that question, and there are people who are trying very hard to br bring that about. Okay, now it's uh, da hinten der Herr and then here vorne. Um, my name is Adrian. I'm an engineering student, and first of all, I want to thank you for uh, bringing this topic up to public interest. Um, I think this discussion about energy is uh, valid, and might also be ba valid for the U.S., but um, in the case of Germany, um, we know that the a second driving uh, economical force after, of course, cars uh, industry is the chemical industry. So um, the um, production of uh, polyethylene, pro polypropylene, polymers, um, those are things we cannot uh, substitute like we could with um, renewables. So my question is, what is what could be our general approach as, um, yeah, well, as states and as humans, in order to not just focus on the topic of energy, but also to replace other um, necessities we have, because as we know, um, well, a process uh, without uh, risks and without CO2 emissions um, are not existent. Thank you. Thank you. That's such an interesting question. And the only answer I have for that and for other particular uses of petrochemical is rationing. As, as oil becomes, a petroleum pro becomes more scarce, it will have to be rationed for uses that society considers most valuable, uh, or which has to be decided in a democratic fashion. Uh, do we want to fly? I mean, I think you can replace automobiles with electric-powered vehicles, and you could travel by train. I think it's going to be a long time before we figure out how to fly, and do we want to have a planet that's interconnected the way it is now? Uh, there are uh, pharmaceuticals that are based on petroleum. There are all kinds of products. So I think, and Fertilizer. and most of all, farming. Section. We cannot support support a population of nine billion people at present without petroleum. Impossible. The current food production system is a petroleum-based based system, and n nobody knows how to do it without oil. So there will have to be a system of rationing socially uh, des designed, democratically designed, that chooses the best outcome. Uh, I think that's the only way. Und es ist definitiv so, dass die großen Ölkonzerne gemeinsam mit den großen Chemiekonzernen ja längst äh, Unsummen in, die, in Forschung und Entwicklung und in die Wissenschaft dessen stecken, was man dann Bioökonomie nennt oder biobasierte ähm, Ökonomie, ähm, wo es ja genau darum geht, wie kann man eigentlich die äh, petroleumbasierten 
chemischen Produkte äh, ähm, verändern. Und es wird nochmal eine ganz andere Debatte sein in Zukunft, inwiefern dann synthetische Biologie oder aber auch pflanzliche Stoffe noch stärker dann äh, genutzt werden, um erdölbasierte Produkte zu ersetzen. Auch da müssen wir dann hinschauen. Was heißt das? Geht es vor allem in synthetisierte, also Biologie, indem man eben bestimmte ähm, Enzyme und sonst was nachbastelt in großen Kesseln oder ob man nachwachsende Rohstoffe brauchen wird, um dann diese äh, erdölbasierten Produkte zu substituieren. Das ist der große Trend. Auch damit fängt die Stiftung sich an zu beschäftigen aus dem Blickwinkel auch der Risiken, die sich dann dahinter verbergen. So, wir haben jetzt noch drei Wortmeldungen. Bitte schön. Dann Sie nochmal. Und war hier noch jemand? Hier und dann ganz hinten. Und dann versuchen wir hier zu einem Ende zu kommen. Vera Müller-Plantenberg. Um, I'm grateful for your lecture. And you were talking about the victim and about how to organize the whole story. And, well, I live far away from pre um, press and from media, from access to media, but I get monthly the National Geographic, and that really impressed me because, and that's where I got the feeling or the, the idea or that there's something happening which is of bigger bigger impact because in two issues within three months this fracking and shell energy was mentioned and it was always mentioned with pictures of the victims and what they are suffering. So my question is what is happening in the US about the press and the media and and them organizing themselves? How is it you you were already mentioning this this type of, um, of the pipelines, which are going to be uh, the opposition against that. But how, what, is, what is happening in real? How far is the US society really aware of, of what is happening? More or less. This. Yes, a very interesting question. And I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I depend for my news on the New York Times. I don't know what the equivalent in Germany would be. I, I, the Süddeutsche Zeitung or yeah, the uh, um, Frankfurter Allgemeine. Yeah, you know, which, which most people don't read the New York Times. They watch television and they get television news or if they, you know, or they get superficial news. So I can, I, I can tell you, the New York Times, for whatever reasons, has chosen to pay... Uh, quite a bit of attention to this issue and to the victims. Uh, they've assigned reporters to Pennsylvania to talk to the victims of fracking. Uh, they've, they've gone to Canada, to the tar sands. They've even gone to the Arctic, to Greenland, to cover this story, and to Alaska. So there's actually been some decent coverage and a recognition For the rest of the news, it's mainly in the alternative press. And I don't know about television. Hmm? Yeah, the protesters, the resistance. Well, this has been done, uh, you know, we, we have to give great credit to, you mean within the media or outside the media? By, by, by uh, social media, by, by Facebook, by, uh, you know, by Internet largely by, by, uh, by citizen groups, so, uh, civil society organizations. Um, much credit has to be given to Bill McKibben, who formed 350.org, which has become a network for, all, for the different victims to come together. Okay, one last question, please. The back, the man with the uh, white jacket. My name is Friedrich Rosen. Uh, Louder. Shall I talk to you in English or German? I don't know. Uh, your China, quite often the Chinese were mentioned. Yeah. Put, put, put the mic on. Uh, quite often the Chinese were mentioned. Yeah. To someone poor in this world, 
he has to save energy. He can't afford it. It's as simple as this. Yeah? And up to a few years ago, uh, average Chinese had to live on a quantum of energy that was given to him. So he had to decide, do I buy myself a fridge yeah, or a television set? Yeah, or, yeah. So there, there were... Now, the, the, the question I have, what do you consider to be a fair and just amount of energy on a global basis? This is, yeah. A one billion that dollar is, question. Yeah, the, you, how many calories or, uh, should be given to the average citizen of this world? Yeah, and... I wonder if your American concerns about your environmental pollution with the extraction of energy yeah, might, to Chinese eye, ear, be something ridiculous or rather preposterous. They had to live yeah, with this, having to share a bit, yeah, and now they want to enjoy their life. Something uh, our world and the American one takes for granted. Yeah, okay. I yes, think we, I, 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 I don't, I mean, I understand that there's uh, issues of equity, and I don't question that for a moment. There are people who live without electricity in parts of the world who want electricity, and that is a fair request. But for those uh, pe people who live in cities in China who can breathe, and who are now finding the health effects of pollution to be so great uh, that that their their children are suffering. There is a growing environmentalist movement in China that is that does question the growth model of the Communist Party, which is which is to put put uh, growth first and the environment second. Yeah. So I, I think the issues that I'm describing are of growing international concern, but I accept what you say, that there is an issue of equity that has to be addressed in all of this. Uh, and I do think there's, there, there should be a, a elements of fairness, so no question about it. Deshalb gibt es ja auch Versuche, sowas wie, was ist eigentlich ein Grundbedürfnis an Energie? Also, dass jeder lesen kann oder kühlen kann. Das sind ja genau solche Überlegungen, die helfen sollen, auch Armen aus einem bestimmten Wohlstand zu geben. Das sind alle möglichen Institutionen, UNDP oder UNEP und andere sind dabei, sowas zu machen. Und natürlich gibt es im Gerechtigkeitskontext die Diskussion, dass eigentlich jeder Mensch nur noch zwei Tonnen CO2 emittieren darf. Und dann weiß man auch, was man eigentlich reinstecken darf, um zu so einer geringen Summe zu kommen. Wir sind in Deutschland immer noch bei zehn Tonnen pro Kopf aber in einem kleinen, in einem armen Land wie Äthiopien bei 0,4 Tonnen pro Kopf. Das macht ja auch nochmal deutlich, wo da der Equity Gap eigentlich liegt. Ja, und natürlich ist es eine, eine Frage auch von Ressourcengerechtigkeit, mit der wir uns äh, weiter beschäftigen müssen, weil ich eben auch sehe, dass Demokratiefragen und vor allem die Gerechtigkeitsfrage vor, äh, im, im, in der globalen Debatte um Ressourcen, aber auch um CO2-Reduktion einfach zu kurz kommt. Und da haben wir einfach die große Aufgabe, diese Equity äh, und die Gerechtigkeitsfrage auch international immer wieder zu adressieren. Ich finde, dass Michael Clare für seinen wunderbaren Vortrag und für die vielen, vielen Fragen, die er beantwortet hat, ein großes Dankeschön und einen großen Applaus verdient hat. Thank you. You, you know, my view, my view is that this is something we all share. These issues are we all share in common, and we all have to think them through together. So, mm -hmm. I appreciate all of your feedback and your comments and your questions. I don't have the answer to all of this. We have to do this 
together. So I'm very glad for this opportunity. Genau. Und ich bin auch sehr froh, dass er eine ganze Menge, wie ich finde, auch gute Vorschläge gemacht hat, wie äh, wir sollten denjenigen, die in unconventional carbon oder überhaupt über in carbon investieren, die Grundlage entziehen. Wir sollen eine Allianz der Opfer schmieden. Wir tun unser Bestes als Stiftung. Ich möchte an dieser Stelle Björn Eklund, Lili Fuhr und ihrem Team danken für die Organisation dieser schönen Veranstaltung, auch wenn wir uns mehr Zuhörerinnen gewünscht hätten. Danke dafür. Ich möchte Sie einladen zur nächsten Green Lecture am 12.09. Äh, auch hier in diesem Raum. Dann werden wir mit Kate Rovers diskutieren zu einem ganz ähnlichen Zusammenhang, ähm, nämlich wie können wir im Kontext planetarischer Grenzen und im Kontext und der Tatsache der sozialen Ungleichheit weltweit eigentlich mit Strategien antworten, die für alle Menschen auf diesem Planeten so etwas wie einen Wohlstand oder ein Leben in, in einigermaßen Befriedigung der Grundbedürfnisse äh, hinzukommen. Kommen Sie am 12.09. Das wird, eine, glaube ich, auch eine sehr, sehr spannende Diskussion im Rahmen von Green Lecture. Wir werden in der nächsten Woche eine neue Veröffentlichung publizieren. Uh, Perspectives heißt sie und wird sich mit, heißt Kupfer, Kohle und Konflikte und wird sich mit der Ressourcenpolitik in Asien beschäftigen. Perspective is, Perspectives ist eine Publikation der Stiftung, wo uns es vor allem darum geht, welche Analysen und welche Lösungsvorschläge kommen aus den Ländern selbst. Also unsere Philosophie ist ja, der, den Menschen in den jeweiligen Ländern, die sich im Protest befinden oder die Lösungen anzubieten haben für eine zukünftige Ressourcenschonung und Ressourcenpolitik, hier in Deutschland Raum zu geben, Platz zu geben, eine Stimme zu geben, www.böll.de ist der Ort, wo Sie diese äh, Perspectives finden können. Und jetzt sind Sie zu Brezeln und einem Getränk oder mehreren, whatever, <lacht> eingeladen. Ähm, und vielleicht auch hat der ein oder die andere noch Lust, ähm, mit äh, Michael Claire zu reden. Wir treffen uns unten, bleiben Sie noch hier, reden Sie miteinander Vernetzung ist auch ein Ziel unserer Veranstaltungen und vielleicht ergibt sich die ein oder andere Allianz gegen nicht nur unkonventionelle Fossile, sondern unter anderem auch für Erneuerbare weiterzustreiten. Herzlichen Dank und Tschüss. Applaus